Logan's Run The seeds of the Little War were planted in a restless summer during the mid-1960s, with sit-ins and student demonstrations as youth tested its strength. By the early 1970s, over 75% of the people living on Earth were under 21 years of age. The population continued to climb, and with it the youth percentage. In the 1980s, the figure was 79.7%. In the 1990s, 82.4%. In the year 2000, critical mass. 10. Her hair was matted, her face streaked with a swol and swollen. One knee oozed slow blood. She's cut it on a steel abutment. A stitching pain lived in her side. She ran. There was a high lover's moon, and the night was full of shapes. Shadows slid on shadows. When had she crossed the river? Was it last night or the night before? Where was she now? She didn't know. Off to her right, she could see an unending length of metal mesh beyond a stretch of dead asphalt. Far out on the pavement seat was a cluster of teeter swings. As industrial nursery, it had to be Stoneham or Sunrise. Perhaps her baby was there. She veered to the left, away from the mesh, into the deep night black between buildings. Abruptly, she found her passage blocked by a high, board barrier. She turned. Maybe she could double back over the river. If she could only rest. Wait! She froze, remained motionless. There was someone in the shadows ahead. A silent scream ripped at her throat. Sandman! Panic drove her heart against her chest in shuddering strokes. She spun about, clawed at the blistered boards, her fingernails breaking as she sought a grip on the coarse wood. The fence was too high. For an instant, a century? She clung there, trying to will her muscles to lift her oh-so-heavy body. But all the energy was gone. Something tore inside her, and she crumpled at the base of the wood. Huddled into herself, she studied the char black. Flower crystal centered in the palm of her right hand. A few days ago it had been a warm blood red, just as seven years before it had been electric blue, and seven years earlier sun yellow. A color for each seven years of her life. Now she was twenty-one, and her flower was dull black, sleep black, death black. The figure moved calmly towards her, across the moon pavement. She didn't look up. She stared at her palm, because her future and her past were written there. All of her days and her nights and her fears and her hopes. Why had she believed in sanctuary? Insane. Impossible. Why hadn't she been like all the others who had accepted sleep? Now the dark figure in black stood over her, but she did not look up. She didn't beg, because begging was useless. Instead, she remade the world. She was not here, outlawed and condemned, shamed and terrified. She was in sanctuary, on a wide, wind-lazy meadow beside a cool stream of silver, a world in which time did not exist. Then why was her hand scrabbling under her torn clothing for the vibro-knife she'd hidden there? Why the urgency to plunge the buzzing steel through her breast and rib into her heart? Why? She saw the gun come up. The Homer. She saw the moonlight dazzle off the dark blue barrel. The Homer. She saw the pale, tight-set face of the Sandman, and saw his eyes above the gun as his fingers whitened on the trigger. The Homer. There was a soft explosion. That was the last thing she heard. And the last thing she felt was raw, blinding agony, as the Homer struck burned, ripped, and unraveled her. Logan was tired, but the little man kept talking. You know how it is, citizen, he said. Nobody feels like he's done it all. All the traveling, all the girls, all the living, I'm no different from anybody else. I'd like to live to be 25, 30, but it just isn't going to happen, and I can accept that. I've got no regrets, none to linger on, I mean. I've lived a good life, I've had my share, and nobody can say that Sawyer is a whiner. He was talking compulsively. As long as he talked, he didn't have to think. Logan had seen a lot of them on last day, talking away the final hours. "'You know what I'm going to do?' asked the man, whose palm flower was blinking red, then black, then red. He didn't wait for a reply. He went on in a rapid voice, telling Logan exactly what he was going to do. Logan had changed to Gray's black back in DC, DS headquarters, and he wondered if the man would be talking to him if he were in his black tunic. No doubt he would. Sawyer was obviously the type who went through life unworried about deep sleep men and guns. Which was proper. He was a good citizen, and good citizens made a stable world. 
And then I'm going over to the Castlemont glass house and get myself three of the youngest, prettiest girls in the stag room. One will be blonde, you know, with deep blue eyes and blue-white hair. And then I'll get one with short black hair and one with golden brown skin. Three beauties. I hear they'll do anything for you when you're on last day. The man looked at his palm. The flower bloomed red, then black, then red. Did you ever wonder if the thinker makes mistakes the same as people do? Because it doesn't seem I've turned 21. It really doesn't. It seems I just turned 14 maybe five years ago. That would make me just 19, he said this without conviction. I remember the day when my flower changed and I was 14. I was in Japan, and it was the first time in Mount I visited Mount Fujiyama. Wonderful mountain. Inspiring. Ever see it? Logan nodded. He'd seen it. I sure remember the day. Couldn't have been more than five years ago, maybe six. Do you think the machine could make that kind of mistake? Logan didn't want to remember how many years had passed since he'd been 14. Of late, he had tried not to think about it. His flower was still a steady red, but no, said Sawyer, asking his own question. The machine wouldn't make that kind of a mistake. He was silent for a long moment. Then, in a quiet voice, he said, I suppose I'm scared. His flower blinked red, black, red, black. Most people are, said Logan. But not this scared, said the man. He swallowed, raising a hand. Don't get me wrong, citizen. I'm no coward. I'm not going to run. I have my pride. The system is right, I know that. World can only support so much life. Got to be a way to keep the population down. I've been loyal, and I won't change now. The two sat quietly as the rumbling belt carried them up through the three-mile complex. At last, the man spoke again. Do you really believe that a homer is... is as terrible as they say it is? Yes, said Logan. I believe it. What gets me is the way it finds a runner. Once it's fired at him, I mean. The way it homes in on the body heat. They say it burns out your whole nervous system, every nerve in your body. Logan didn't answer. The little man's face was gray. A muscle leaped in his cheek. He swallowed. God, he said. Sawyer drew in a deep breath. A spot of color returned to his face. Of course it's necessary. Without the DS men and homers, there'd be a lot more runners. We couldn't have that. Runner deserves what he gets, if you ask me. I mean, he doesn't have to run. A sleep shop isn't so bad, is it? We toured one when I was twelve, me and a friend of mine, in Paris. Clean and nice. It isn't so bad. Logan thought of the sleep shops with their gaily painted interiors and attendants in soft pastel robes, the electronically augmented angel choirs, the skin spray of hallucinogen, which wiped away a confused look of suffering and replaced it with a fixed and joyful smile. He thought of the quiet, dim-lit grave rooms lined with aluminium shelving, and of the neat rows of steel foil canisters marked with the names and numbers of men. No, said Logan, it isn't so bad. Sawyer was talking again. Sometimes, though, I wonder about those DS men. I could never do it, what they have to do. Not that I'm defending runners, not scum, I don't defend scum. But I just wonder how a man can fire a homer into... I get off here, said Logan. He left the belt. Logan was annoyed at his action. He didn't live in this part of the complex. His unit was almost a mile beyond. But the man's constant chatter had frayed his patience. He knew this section, of course. He, a year ago, he'd me hunted a man here, runner named Nathan. He closed off the memory. Idly, he began walking the covered thoroughfare. Ahead was the jewel building. Logan paused to survey the vast mural which gave the structure its flame. A climbing mosaic composed of tiny bits of fire glass brilliantly arranged to commemorate the burning of Washington. Orange, purple, and red raw flames jeweled halfway up the facade. Bodies flamed, buildings smoked and tumbled. Yet the awesome masterwork was flawed, incomplete. Stark, gaping areas broke the pattern. Only the framed muralist Robler Seven could handle the corrosive fire glass, and when he had accepted sleep, his secret died with him. The project would never be finished. Directly beneath the mural, a man with a sign. Logan registered shock. The man was about fifteen, with rounded, girlish features and large, soulful eyes. A silver fringe of beard soaked his chin, and his hair was worn shoulder length. The sign around his neck said, RUN. He sat, image still, in the middle of the walkway. Several angry citizens circled him. One of them spat on the bearded man. Filth! Scum! Coward! The man smiled patiently at his tormentors. He handed each of them a thin script sheet from a stack in his lap. This is disgusting, said a fat woman, bawling the script in her hand. Unlawful! 
As Logan approached, the man held out one of the sheets. He accepted it. Reject sleep. Run. If there are enough runners, there won't be enough homers. There won't be enough DS men. It is written that the lifespan of man is three score years and ten. Seventy years. Don't settle for twenty-one. Run. Reject sleep. A police paravane settled soundlessly at the edge of the walkway. Logan watched the two lemon-tunicked officers dismount and advance on the bearded man. He did not try to run. They led him away. The paravane lifted back into the evening sky. A woman next to Logan clucked her tongue. That's the third maniac they've arrested this month. You'd think they were disorganized. It's frightening. You'd think they were organized. A girl in green mist silks eased out of a doorway and fell into a step beside Logan. He ignored her. The darkness had deepened and the sky was splashed with emerging stars. An air freshener hummed. Logan stopped to, why the, to watch the tri-dim report. The proscenium of the TD News Building brightened. A familiar 300-foot figure took solid form. He smiled warmly down at the crowd. The tri-dimensional newsman was dressed in life-leather trim fits. His giant eyes were clear and guileless. Evening, citizens, he boomed. This is Madison 24 with the latest news. Trouble in the maze tonight. A gypsy gang war on an express platform near Stafford Heights resulted in two deaths. Fourteen individuals were injured, including three gypsies. Police are investigating, and there will be arrests. The immense figure paused for dramatic effect, then continued. The triple slayer, Harry Seven, was apprehended earlier today in the Truncus complex. His friends were invited to see him off in the hell car, but not one person showed up. Not one. The giant face nodded sternly. Does that tell you something, citizens? It tells me something. Yes, indeed. It tells me that we are a proud, law-loving people, ashamed of runners and killers that we are. Logan stopped listening. He became aware of the girl at his side. You're not happy, the girl in green said. I can always tell. I have a gift for knowing, for sensing unhappiness. Her eyes shone with fierce intensity. I sympathize with unhappy men. She placed a soft hand on his waist and pressed lightly. He shook off the hand. Logan walked away, lengthening his stride. I could make you happy, called the girl. Her voice drifted after him fat, faintly. Make you happy. Happy. Logan turned the word over in his mind. Restlessness gnawed at him. You can't buy happiness. But of course, you could. The hallucinol on Robert was one of the city's largest. The drugs, administered by trained professionals, were non-addictive. Logan had tried several and found that LF produced the happiest effects. Lysergic foam, an extension of the old LSD formula developed more than a century and a half ago. It required 60 seconds to run a man's bloodstream. After that, expanded consciousness. Synthetic bliss. LF, Logan to told the man in white. Dosage? Standard. Follow me, please. Logan was taken to the blue room. A small, padded chamber with a table, a chair, and a blue floor. And nothing else. A woman was coming out of the room. Her face was papery, her eyes still partially glazed. Logan took the drug flask handed him, swallowed the contents. Have a good lift, the man in white said as he closed the door. Logan sat down in the chair, keeping his eyes closed for a full minute, allowing the LF to work itself into his blood. Then he relaxed, opened his eyes. A terrible illumination fired the room, and Logan knew it was going to be a bad lift. Window, he thought. Got to reach the window. It was open when he reached it, and he fell out of the window, dropping down rapidly into the heart of the three-mile complex. A short, squat man caught him. You were running, the man said. That's fine. No, I was falling. There's a big difference. It was important that he be understood. I fell from a window. Fell. Logan twisted away, began to run. He ran through hissing fire galleys. The world smelled of dream dust, and a million voices were dirging the coda to Black Flower. The short, squat man dropped him with a blow. Again, said the man, crouched. But Logan had the gun. He didn't need to take any more of this damned punishment. He pulled the trigger, and the world exploded. On the way out, the attendant grif grinned at Logan. You were really lifted. Like another? No thanks, said Logan, and left the building. He didn't feel any better. On the upper level, he slowed. A group of youngsters approached him, their palms glowing like blue fireflies in the soft dark. As they passed, Logan heard snatches of heated arguments. 
The Reddies don't remember we've got rights, too. They just better begin to... Echoes of the Little War. Logan moved on towards the play of colored lights on the glasshouse ahead. The big dome was frosted in white, and interior images were indistinct. A contortion of naked, masked bodies formed in a high, arched entrance, and the steps leading inside were illumined from below. Pleasure, gleamed a step. Satisfaction, gleamed another. Rare delights, gleamed a third. Logan entered. Your pleasure is our pleasure, sir, a flax-haired girl said to him mechanically. She was seated at a flow desk and wore red satin transpants. Logan placed his right palm flat to the desk, an inaudible click. The desk would bill him for the visit. He walked into the stag room. It was a wash in sexuality. Here were beach girls from Mexico and California, Japanese maidens with shy eyes, Italian girls with mooned bodies, pert Irish lads, slim exotas from Calcutta, cool English women, and full-figured French girls. And here, because they were lonely or bored or oversexed, because they were looking for someone new or escaping from someone old, or for no reason at all except that the glasshouse was here to be used and it was a time for mingling and touching in a shadow search for love. You never find the people that you go to meet in dreams. A girl with a blue palm swayed towards Logan. She was Eurasian and, at thirteen, a year away from womanhood. I'm adept, she said. You'll find me skilled beyond any others. Logan ignored her, gesturing to an older girl with red hair flowing along her back. She was swan white with deep lashed eyes of coral. You, he said. The girl glided in his direction, the thin silk of her gown clouding behind her. Not me, she laughed, linking arms with a blue blonde with a blue gold blonde. Logan was irritated. Ordinarily he would have been excited, flushed with anticipation. Tonight he felt dulled by what he saw. He waved another female to him, a lithe girl with Slavic features and full hips. She smiled, took his hand. They caught a riser up, passing tier on tier, stepped into a glass hall, moved in darkness to a glass room. The girl told her that her name was Karenya III. I'm a three also, Logan told her. Don't talk, she said feverishly. Why do men always want to talk? Logan sat down on the bed and began to unbutton his shirt. The girl was already nude, having cast aside a thin garment of spun gauze. How many times have I come to a place like this, he asked himself, to a lonely, empty house of glass. Glass all around them, glass walls and ceilings and floors, the bed glass fiber. The chairs and tables, glass. The building was one vast, transparent globe, shot periodically with colored lights. Each room was equipped to illume itself at irregular intervals, but it was also impossible determine, to determine just when a room would flare into brightness. Caught in the act of lovemaking, a couple would suddenly find themselves tangled in a wash of silver, or gold, or red, yellow, or green. Other couples, around, above, and below, would be able to watch them from glass floors, walls, ceilings. Then the light would die, to spring on in another chamber. Here, said the girl, lie here. Logan eased into the glass foam bedding. She guided his hands, and he gave himself over to this woman, holding and stroking her body in the darkness. Look, she cried. In the tear above them, bathed in hot gold, a man and a woman writhed in a love heat. Then darkness. The night deepened. Logan and Karenya were frozen in silver, arms and legs twined. They were conscious of the eyes around them in the dome, watching hungrily. Darkness again. Light bloomed, died, flared, and died in the love depths of the structure. Until dawn sketched the glass house. The loving was over and done. Jeez, how long is this chapter? Okay, eight more pages. We will stop there and resume tomorrow.